Welcome to the CHCI Fall Health Summit Panel, Nuestra Familia, Health Justice for Latino Children and Families. This session is made possible by the generous contributions of our sponsors, Casey Family Programs, Fresenius Medical Care North America, and United Health Group. Our panel host for today will be Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, representing Illinois' 4th District. The district covers Chicago's southwest and northwest sides and parts of several western suburbs. Representative Garcia serves on the House Financial Services Committee, the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and the House Committee on Natural Resources. We have welcoming remarks from Dr. Robert Kosman, Chief Medical Officer of Fresenius Medical Care North America. Our moderator for today's session is Russell Contreras, the race and justice reporter at Axios, covering the policies and agencies at the heart of the administration of justice and how it impacts people of color. He is also the co-author of the Axios Latino newsletter, a partnership with Axios and Telemundo. Please welcome remarks from Congressman Garcia and Robert Kosman, followed by our moderator, Russell Contreras. Good afternoon. I want to start off by thanking CHCI for leading this critical conversation. I represent a working class district with a large immigrant population and also one of the youngest in Illinois. We got hit hard by the pandemic. I saw firsthand the struggles of my community and others like it across the country and everything that we face. Even before the pandemic, my district was disproportionately impacted by high rates of asthma, diabetes, and other chronic conditions. Some of my constituents forego healthcare altogether because of their immigration status. These inequities did not happen by accident. They are codified into law. So to fix the problem, we have to change our laws. Let's talk about policies that would unequivocally improve the health of Latino children and families. Would the pandemic have played out differently if everyone had access to affordable quality health care and we had Medicare for all? Imagine if your neighbors didn't worry about backbreaking medical bills just for seeking care. And we can't forget the importance of investments in our environment. The numbers are clear. Latinos are more likely to suffer from climate change and pollution. My neighborhood, Little Village, already ranks at the 98th percentile nationally for air pollution causing cancer and other respiratory diseases. It's no surprise that our kids are hospitalized for asthma at three times the rate of others in Chicago. All of my work, from an activist in my neighborhood to a member of Congress, is focused on ending disinvestment and neglect that makes us sick. Last Congress, I introduced the Health Equity and Accountability Act as a way to address the disparities that our communities face that were only exacerbated during the pandemic. We need legislation that fixes our community's ailments at the root, from ensuring our kids have food on the table and clean, healthy air, to stronger investments in their education. Thank you for inviting me to this important conversation today. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Robert Kosman. Chief Medical Officer for Fresenius Medical Care North America. It's a pleasure to be with you at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's 2021 Health Policy Summit. Our panel today will examine the underlying social, economic, and environmental determinants that cause Latino health disparities. As a nephrologist with more than 20 years of experience in private practice, I've personally seen how social determinants of health can increase the risk of chronic conditions like kidney disease. Inadequate housing, food insecurity, and lack of access to nutritious foods are all risk factors for chronic kidney disease. We have seen tremendous innovation and new models of value-based care that are helping us identify concerns and intervene earlier in disease progression. When it comes to kidney care, this new focus on value-based care is leading to new partnerships that improve patient transportation and treatment access, relieve food insecurity, and offer health coaching for dialysis patients. 
These new programs and interventions are showing we can reduce hospitalizations for people living with chronic kidney disease. Additionally, when these programs are combined with technological innovations such as artificial intelligence and connected health, we're able to intervene earlier than ever before to provide much better options for treatment choices. This is why we're seeing record numbers of patients choosing to do their dialysis at home instead of in center. Yet we know there's a lot more to do, and there are still too many healthcare disparities that need to be addressed. Forums like this one can help make a difference. I applaud the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for taking the time to examine these issues and for developing the next generation of Latino and Latina leaders by providing students and young professionals with leadership, public service, and policy experience. Thank you, and have a great session. Good afternoon. My name is Russell Contreras, and I'm the race and justice reporter here at Axios. I'm honored to be here today to help lead this important discussion. And thank you, U.S. Rep. Jesus Chuy Garcia, for setting the stage for your opening remarks. And thank you, CHCI, for hosting this health summit and focusing attention on the importance of healthcare justice. I'm delighted to be joined today by four national experts on this topic. First, please welcome Dr. Eliseo Perez Stabre, the Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes for of Health. Previously, Dr. Perez Stable practiced primary care internal medicine for 37 years at UCSF. He's a recognized leader in Latino health and disparity research, having spent 32 years leading research on smoking and tobacco control in Latino populations. Eliseo, thank you, and thank you for joining us. Delighted to be here. Thank you for the welcome. Next, let's welcome Dr. Linda Lopez. She is the, founding, the founder of Impact Strategies and a strategic consulting firm advising governments, corporations, and philanthropy on their social and economic impact investments. She is currently a senior consultant at KC Family Programs on a groundbreaking initiative to examine the impacts of the social determinants of health on Latinx families and children. She previously served as the head of the Office of Immigrant Affairs for Los Angeles Mayor um, Dr. Lopez, thank you for joining us. You there, Dr. Lopez? While we work on Dr. Lopez, please uh, welcome uh, Monica Gonzalez. She is the Director of Federal Government Relations for Share Our Strength, where she leads federal strategy, building bipartisan relationships, and serves as the organization's primary representative before Congress and the administration. Throughout this pandemic, Monica has successfully directed the organization's federal response to COVID-19, advancing legislation and policy solutions to ensure that all children would have access to meals during the pandemic, and their national recovery is inclusive and equitable. Monica, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Jaime Murillo. He's a senior VP at Ottoman Labs and the chief cardi uh, cardio a metabolic Health Officer at United Health Group, where he is focused on designing comprehensive care solutions to improve health. He's a cardiologist from Yale University with an extensive background in computer science, AI, research, you name it. He's practiced general cardiology uh, and imaging for 20 years. Jaime, thank you for joining us today. So I want to start off this discussion uh, with you, Monica, and Dr. Lopez. Monica, I'll go with you first. Around 50% of Latinos live below the, the poverty line, and around 18% lack health insurance. This pandemic has exposed some of these disparities and showed how vulnerable Latinos are based on their employment. But how are the regions where Latinos live and their economic reality contributing to these disparities? Monica, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's important to understand that we were already dealing with food, high rates of food insecurity among Latino families before the pandemic. So food insecurity has always been prevalent. I think what we need to understand are what are the barriers for Latino families? It could be transportation, 
It could be access to affordable, healthy food within their community. It could also mean that they're not accessing all of the supports and the programs that are available to help Latino families be able to thrive. So I think it's important to understand that we're not talking about just in terms of their income, we're talking about the overall community. What is in that community that will help lift Latino communities out of poverty and to give them access to the health and the nutrition that they deserve? And Dr. Lopez, since you've worked for the city of Los Angeles, you can tell where someone's born that may determine someone's health future, especially in the immediacy. What can you say about where Latinos are born or where they live and how that contributes to disparities? Thank you, Russell, for the question. Um, so yes, you know, I think there's definitely regional differences when it comes to health outcomes, but it also means that when we use the social determinants of health as a framework, that we're better able to understand the different nuances and the impacts of both health you know, disparities, but also the economic realities that many of these families face day in and day out. Uh, and I think for the project that I'm working on with Casey Family Programs, we are assessing uh, through a 14 state comparative analysis and regional analysis in areas where there's high Latino populations these different variations that exist when it comes to issues related to health, but also housing, uh, the environmental space that they live in, the uh, economic impacts of COVID-19 on these families. And through these interviews, what we've learned is that there is a lot of there are a lot of people that are struggling, unfortunately, living day by day to pay for their housing, especially in high rent housing markets uh, throughout the country. And that number two, the services and programs that are available for them sometimes are restrictive because of their immigration status. And so I wanted to pick up on that point because that is something that we're learning that there is definitely barriers and challenges to accessing the social safety net when it comes to uh, these different programs and initiatives that 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 are present in m many different states, and it, it also varies, obviously, by state as well. And just and Dr. to build on that, go ahead, go ahead just to, Yeah, just to build on that a little bit more on what Dr. Lopez said about immigration status, is that we also see in kids who live in mixed status families that the public charge rule had such a chilling effect on these families that they were not applying for programs or participating in programs during the pandemic where their kids were eligible to receive um, these food benefits. So I think it's important to recognize that when we talk about policies, we have to also make sure that we are looking at them through the lens of the participant and removing all of the systemic barriers that stand in their way um, to be able to access these programs so that they can thrive. And Dr. Perez Sable, um, we've often blamed genetics for the high percentage of Latinos with conditions like diabetes and heart disease. We've heard it from family, pero tu sabe, you know, well, I had diabetes, I'm probably going to get it. But research has shown that us, that genetics may not be as a determining factor as we once thought. What factors are in play when we dissect these health disparities among Latinos? Well, first of all, um, Absolutely not. Genetics is not the, the determining factor as maybe people thought because people were thinking of single gene mutations that cause a disease, you know, like we see in cystic fibrosis or in sickle cell disease and others. And uh, chronic diseases are very multifactorial and even the genetics of it are quite complicated. What we know about it is multiple genes at work. So you're right. It, genetics is an influence. It's a factor, but not the determining factor only. It's been shown that if you have a predisposition to diabetes because of genetics, let's say, there are two reversible factors that lead to much higher risk. One is excess weight. So as your uh, body mass index goes up above even moderate obesity, uh, 35, uh, then your risk goes up. And the other is lack of physical activity. Uh, so both of these are influenced by the environment. We mentioned earlier food insecurity. That's a big factor. 
where you live uh, it influences this very much. The other thing to consider in this multifactorial component of what leads to disparities um, is uh, socioeconomic status. And the idea that if you're an immigrant and you come into the U.S., uh, as you acculturate, you're going to have bad habits and get, you know, like the rest of the U.S., you go eating junk food or whatever, uh, is not always the case because uh, social mobility it, it varies. And some people remain in their culture, remain with healthy foods, and others move up the socioeconomic status and, and, and move out of, uh, don't avoid the unhealthy food. So... Uh, we're actively working on some of these social factors uh, components in my own research, but I think that uh, it's not a simple story. And uh, and just to reiterate the point, uh, all racial ethnic minorities in the U.S. that have been studied have higher rates of diabetes compared to their white counterparts. So this is not a Latino or Mexican issue only. So, and I'll go to you, Dr. Lopez, while we wait for Dr. Murillo to return. So. What Dr. Perez Tabla is saying is my Spanish surname does not, condone, not, not condemn me to diabetes, that they're behavioral and also economic realities that may determine whether I get diabetes or heart disease based on where I lived and how, you know, my, my, my economic uh, reality. Absolutely. And it isn't... Um... Uh, it's a, when we look at populations, we get risks for a population, and every individual is different. But yes, on average, Latinos in this country, uh, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans have been studied. Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, about double the risk of diabetes compared to whites. And for African Americans, it's also higher for all, most Asian groups that have been studied. So that's a population risk, not an individual one. Factors, as you as you pointed out, weight physical activity really influences. So what you eat also influences because that determines what your weight ends up being. And Dr. Murillo is back, so you can go back to him. Yeah. And Dr. Murillo, um, on that note, we were talking about how genetics is a determining factor, as we once thought, for diabetes and heart disease. Is there still an, an education uh, component that, that really needs to go on with Latinos in telling them that we need to think about preventative care, that we just not need to um, be so disenchanted and saying, because I have a Spanish surname, I'm destined to get diabetes and heart disease. Como mi tía, ya, right? Is there an education component we need to be talk, talking about here? Yeah, I think you, um, let me just clarify, um, because you're right in, in both points and Dr. Lopez just, just mentioned, but let me just say a couple of things. Number one, the, there are three reasons why we see health disparities. Uh, number one is a genetic component. But many of us argue that it's just a small portion of the, the, the health uh, disparities that we see. So there may be a genetic predisposition, but doesn't explain the entire spectrum of why we see what we see in the Hispanic population. Number two reason is the systemic racism uh, that is uh, inherent, whether it's um, uh, conscious or unconscious, but that, that exists in our healthcare system. But the third most important uh, reason is the social um, uh, component, the social determinants of health. That's the part where I think an education will, make, will create more impact. And that's the part that healthcare companies really have to address. And, and I'm sure we'll have more opportunities to address that, uh, to talk about. But those important, the, the aspect of education is key. But more importantly, uh, and we're going to keep emphasizing that point, the social determinants of health. Dr. Lopez, 50 years ago, Senator Robert Kennedy toured uh, impoverished, impoverished areas to highlight hunger in Mississippi, Central California, the Ogala Lakota land in um, South Dakota. But today, if you go to those same places and along the border in New Mexico and Arizona, the issue isn't necessarily hunger, but malnutrition. What's going on here and how does food insecurity affect disparities? I mean, I think this question that you raise is is so fundamental uh, because also, you know, when, when we're doing this research, when, when I've been doing this research that I mentioned re just right now, you know, that the families that we're interviewing, uh, that's one of the number one issues that they raise with us is, you know, there's been times when, you know, they, they don't have enough food, so they have to go to a local community food bank or they have to go to a local community-based organization to get food. 
Um, so we're seeing the, the sort of presence of that based on these interviews that we're doing or conducting at this point. But larger, the larger issue, I think, is that even pre sort of COVID-19, uh, Latinos already faced a lot of food insecurity. Uh, and one of the most recent studies by Northwestern University shows that there was, you know, maybe about 16% or so food insecurity within the Latino community. But then when the pandemic hit, it reached up, upwards to 46%. And so you, you see that, you know, there's al there was already that issue in our community, but it's been exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, simply because of the fact, I mean, there's a number of factors, but one factor, of course, is that a lot of our community were the essential workers, right, uh, who were left unemployed, um, are in positions and employ employment that don't necessarily provide different sort of labor uh, guarantees or, or supports, uh, but also many of them were also excluded from some of the federal funding stimulus package, if you think about mixed status families, for example, who have US citizen born children. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that I think um, Monica ad addressed recent, recently in this conversation is the fact that public charge has also had a significant impact in the ability of Latino families to access food. And so when you think about uh, programs like SNAP, which is one of the largest federal programs for food, there is or has been research that's showing the disenrollment uh, by uh, particularly individual immigrant families that don't necessarily have immigration status, disenrolling from those programs or not necessarily accessing programs like SNAP. Uh, and so I think one thing that we should definitely consider is looking at also how the cultural and linguistic services, how those services are provided when it comes to food. Uh, and because one of the things that we're also seeing in the research that we're conducting the landscape analysis for Casey family programs is that a lot of these families don't necessarily want to access the food because they fear that if they do, they would be considered a public charge, for example. So there are a lot of different factors, I think, that create this, this environment where there is food insecurity. But I would say, secondly, the other thing that's been pointed out by some of the families in, uh, that we've been interviewing is the fact that there is no access to healthy foods in the neighborhoods where some of our uh, communities live. Uh, so for example, um, you know, going to a local, um, you know, food uh, supermarket, it, you know, it's far away. Uh, so they rely then on getting other types of food that is closer by. So it could be, you know, fast food, which is cheaper. Um, so it's obviously unhealthy, uh, but there are also challenges, I think, and barriers to securing healthy food within these neighborhoods also. So that's another thing that we, we should really think about is the accessibility in terms of the proximity of food to the communities that are, you know, impacted. By, by food insecurity generally defined. So those are the Monica, two you've, things I would say. Yeah. And Monica, you've said that malnutrition and hunger are very closely related cousins. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you're talking about malnutrition. I think what a lot of people don't understand is, and, and probably don't know, is that the school lunch program was signed into law in um, 1946. And it was done because recruits were showing up um, to fight in the war malnourished. Um, they were not prepared to serve this country. And so that program was actually created out of an abundance of national security to ensure that, that our recruits were healthy and ready to serve. But the school lunch program today serves over 30 million kids um, and reaches um, you know, over 100,000 public schools. This program has been a critical lifeline for many kids. But to understand the connection is when we talk about SNAP and the importance of accessing SNAP, that is what we use to often enroll kids into the school lunch programs. It's another way in which we make sure that kids are not falling through the gap. But the other piece is that, you know, diet-related diseases have 
dramatically increased in the last 30 years, you know, causing us to focus on nutrition quality and food access. And so malnutrition is um, a nutrition security issue. And so when people are experiencing food insecurity, struggling with hunger, that means that they're also not getting good nutrition. And so we have to understand all the interconnections. And I think the other piece is when we talk about chronic conditions being so prevalent among the Latino community, it starts at birth. It starts with kids having access to good food, good nutrition, making good choices about the types of food that they can eat. But if it's not available to them in the community or income is a barrier, then these kids are not off to the best start in life. That's why we have to do everything possible to make sure that these school nutrition programs, not only during the school time, but during the summertime, that is the hungriest time of the year for kids. And so for kids who live in more rural areas, who live along the border, who live in suburban communities, who cannot access meal sites during the summertime, we have to do everything possible to make sure programs that we saw during the pandemic, like Pandemic EBT, continue in the summertime to make sure that kids have consistent, reliable access to good nutrition all year round. That is just incredibly important if we're really gonna to begin to address the health disparities among Latinos. And Dr. Murillo, um, on that note, the racial and ethnic makeup of healthcare providers can also limit how Latinos relate to healthcare. I can tell you right now, I, I walk into um, a meeting with uh, my primary care physician, if they're not Latino, person of color, I may not be as honest because I don't want to be judged, but I also want them to judge us. So how do we create this workforce that is diverse and culturally competent? Yes, thank you for that question, Russ, because it's, it's critical and, it, and it's relevant. Uh, before I answer that question, let me just emphasize what uh, Dr. Lopez and Monica just said, because it's critical. If I ask you, what percentage of your care today is relevant in terms of the clinical part of the uh, is relevant. And, and most of us think, think that if we go to the doctor and they have, okay, he knows all my story about he or she has uh, his blood pressure, diabetes and so on, I'm gonna be taken care of. It turns out, and, and this may come as a surprise to many, that only 10% of the clinical information is, is relevant to your health outcomes in the future. So uh, to Monica's and Linda's points is, is, is the addressing those behavioral and social determinants starting from, from the very beginning uh, and, and even from, from the uh, pregnancy standpoint, uh, for instance, so we did at United Healthcare, we, uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll be glad to hear that we uh, won the CMS Health Equity Award in 2020 because we understand the need for us to address those issues. We did, we work with, uh, uh, women in Hawaii, Chicago, and, and Michigan, uh, as Cuban, Michigan, and Ohio, to address um, disparities in among uh, pregnant women and reduce them by 40 to 83 percent in several instances. Those are the kind of efforts that we need to make, and then move move forward, you know, to childhood. And Monica explained that very well to adulthood, to Medicare. And so, to Medicare, for instance, the part of that culture in our in our uh, Latino culture is that we take care of everybody. And everybody lives together, and we have the abuelitas who live with us, and we are we are caretakers by by definition. So we understand also um, that in United Healthcare, and we have done uh, a tremendous amount of progress in terms of addressing those issues. So we have spent you know close to uh, half a billion dollars in housing because we understand that it's it's not just about clinical part; it's housing. Is we deliver 70 million uh, meals last year alone. Uh, Medicare is uh, is a program where we have 53% of our Hispanic population enrolled, 98% of satisfaction. I was thinking about it and I say, I bet my children won't even give me a 98% satisfaction when I asked them uh, whether they they they, uh, <laughs> they like my care and, and, and not even asking about equity at home. But anyway, uh, it's uh, but it's, it's it's how we address this. And so in and in 30 seconds, I'll address your question about diversity. For 10 years, since 2000, actually 15, since 2007, we we created a diversity initiative, uh, scholars that initiative, where we actually uh, give grants to train people who are going to be doing
doing care for Latinos, for uh, uh, African Americans, Asians, and so on. And so we partnered uh, with different associations, including the National Hispanic Foundation. And we have distributed uh, more than 3,000 grants because we believe that having a Latino, uh, in this case, a Hispanic caretaker is essential. Someone who understands the language. I practiced for 20 years I, when my patients came in and they will say the things that I knew what they meant. I was not, I didn't have to translate that because if I translated it, I would, it would lose it, its meaning. So it's essential that we really diversify our workforce. And we do that both in the front providers, of, uh, but also in the people who are behind the scenes, because those are the ones who are getting those calls. And those are the ones who need, need to direct people to, to the right places. We need to help them navigate their needs. So it is essential that we continue to uh, diversify our workforce. There's no question about that. And Dr. Perez Table, how does cultural perception affect health? Um, well, let me just also add to what Dr. Murillo said. You know, the profession is in a crisis at this point. 14% of all graduating physicians today are African American, Latino, American Indian, or Pacific Islander. And yet we make up about a third of the U.S. population. That's a huge gap. And, and with nurses or public health scientists or any of the scientific, the STEM workforce, we're in the same exact place. So the pipeline's not empty. 14% is a lot better than it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but we're not, we're, we're not producing enough. And we need to emphasize this. Uh, in clinical medicine, you don't have to be the best test taker or the best memorizer to be a really terrific clinician. And, and I think that's something that our medical school uh, need to really uh, em embrace and put into, into action in terms of a holistic admissions to care. I think uh, the importance of culture uh, in affecting health or cultural perception, you mean from the um, individual perspective, uh, people grow up uh, with a culture and beliefs that shape their behavior and their thinking. And that's true for the United States, uh, people of middle class or high or higher socioeconomic status is true for Latin America. And it varies a little bit depending on the place. Um, I think that the way we bridge that in clinical medicine is through communication skills. And clinicians need to be able to uh, see all people, right? And we, it's not like we select who we want to uh, be our, our patients. They come to us. Um, or we get a panel and, and we have to adapt to different, different types of people and connect with them in their reality and sympathize with them and respect them in a way that, um, that in the U.S. does mean very many different possibilities. Of course, as your experience, that if you have a Latino doctor and you're Latino, or I even heard as a clinician, uh, a minority who wasn't Latino who said they just felt more comfortable uh, with someone like me. <laughs> I think with my, my older uh, patients, when I was younger, uh, I was like, you know, the kid down the block uh, that they knew from the community. And so they could identify with me because they could have been a neighbor. And in fact, I run in, pe in patients of mine in the store in the, in the Mission District in San Francisco when I would go shopping. So there is something of value there that uh, hasn't been, uh, I think, uh, promoted sufficiently in, in our in our society. But I do believe this is valuable. And, you know, depending on the culture, it has different applications. Dr. Linda Lopez, I want to ask this before we get to our questions. Is that many Latinos have moved into historically racially segregated neighborhoods connected to our history with Jim Crow and anti-Black policies like redlining and slavery. How has this issue of housing and historic segregation affected Latino health? Because they're moving into areas where we have issues that have yet to be addressed. How does that affect our health? So, I mean, I think that's a really great question, Russ, because, you know, I live in LA. It's a very um, diverse city and region. And I think you're seeing also the rise of you know different segments of the latino population also heading to new destinations and i wanted to pick up on that because 
we do see a lot of residential segregation, even in a place like LA, um, but you also see that in other parts of the country. And so I think the, the important thing to consider here is the fact that where you live is, is a determinant of how you're going to be able to actually access the healthcare system or whether or not you do get certain illnesses or disease. That's one. The second thing is, housing is is i think directly connected to obviously the whole entire holistic approach of how we see or how we vision healthcare because if you're living in a housing project or in a housing condition that impacts your health for example you're not living near a park where you can have physical activity or you're not necessarily able to uh, take your kids to school to high quality education or you're not able to you know, feel safe in your community. All of these you know, social determinants of health have impacts on the design and, and sort of the way in which we, we approach health. And so that, that is really something that's very important is to see the interconnections between housing, res residential segregation, but also economic outcomes, social outcomes, health outcomes for our community. The last thing I would say is that we also need to do a better job of doing more comparative analysis of states and regions when it comes to the social determinants of health. And I think the Casey Family Studies program, the Casey Family Program study that we're doing right now or conducting in the field is giving us an opportunity to look at this from the lens of not just the social determinants of health framework but also the variations that exist across 14 different states in this country and Puerto Rico, which is obviously an, another case study in, a, in and of itself. But the point is, is that we really need to consider state by state, but also regional ways in which all of these different social determinants of health really impact our communities, both in the short term, but also in the long term. So I think that's the point of this research that we're doing in this landscape analysis is to one assess from the vantage point of the lived experiences of the families their intergenerational family households that were were profiling here in terms of the interviews but also you know immigration status how does that impact their likely outcomes how does their housing condition impact you know their their uh, health outcomes so it's, it's very much about a, a holistic approach, um, utilizing that frame in, in, as, as a way to understand and better understand those different challenges and barriers. And Monica, the final two minutes that we have left, how does health, uh, mental health and trauma play a role in our overall health? Sometimes we decouple those two, but they're very much related. I mean, I think, you know, it's all very interrelated. I think in terms of when we talk about children and the trauma they have experienced in the last two years, I mean, think about it. We know that children of color will account for 65% 65, 65 of those who have lost a primary caregiver, meaning that they have lost a parent, a custodial grandparent, um, a grandparent caregiver, um, someone who provided love in their home, someone who provided basic needs for these children. And so now they're even in some cases facing orphanhood as a result. This is very traumatic for children. On top of that, you think about the fact that they're also struggling with hunger. Even though that the USDA came out and said, okay, we're seeing a better, we're seeing improvement on food insecurity, that was not true for Latino children they continue to struggle with food insecurity. So imagine that you go to bed every night and you wonder, you know, where will my next meal come from? Who's gonna take care of me? These kids are really dealing with a lot of trauma. And so we have to take into consideration their overall well-being, not just their physical health, but their mental health. And we have known, the data has shown that kids who struggle with food insecurity also, it, it impacts their cognitive development. It impacts their behavior in the classroom. And we also know that, you know, kids, adolescents, um, kids who are much older, who are 
curbing back their food intake because they're trying to make sure younger kids eat, their abuelita is eating, often experience depression and suicidal ideation. So the important, it's so important that these kids are getting access to good food every day and throughout the year because it is so important that we're putting these kids on a healthy start. And I think the other thing I wanna go back to when you talk about um, segregation is that when we talk about systemic racism, it also leads to narratives about who these um, people are. And we have to make sure that these are people who are hardworking, they have dignity and we must treat them with dignity. And so I'm always concerned that we don't often talk about the harmful narratives that stand in the way of making sure that we're providing all of these communities with everything that they need to thrive. Now we have, we're going to go to our questions to, from the audience, and I'm going to combine some of those questions if I feel they're repetitive or we need to expand on them. Currently, we talk about Latino families within communities and the lack of um, care coming from the federal government or the responsibility. But what is going on within communities in response when there are disparities? I know we've talked about some healthcare clinics, but can anybody tell us the uniqueness of what's going on with these clinics? I think Dr. Lopez, this may be a, something that you know very well. Sure, sure. And then I'll pass it on to Dr. Murillo because I know he has a couple of things to say as well about this. But one of the one of the things that we're uncovering with this uh, landscape analysis that I've mentioned is that community health clinics provide vital services for communities broadly defined, but also for Latino communities in regions where they are they're 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 a lot of sort of density of, of Latino populations. And one thing that, that is clear is that many uh, new sort of innovative developments have happened. They're not new to, 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 to people who are from Latin America, but um, if, you, if you think about, for example, the Promotora model in some of the, um, for example, the vaccination campaigns that have happened across the country, Promotoras serve, you know, as ambassadors and trusted actors within communities that are able to share and disseminate information, good quality information, and then also have the benefit of actually getting trained as healthcare, you know, workers within these different communities. So I think we're seeing the, the sort of rise in the amplification of the training of a whole cadre of women who are culturally and linguistically competent to then have them be those trusted ambassadors so that hopefully the community responds in a way that is affirmative in terms of making sure that they take care of themselves from a health perspective but also you know the the unraveling of disseminating information on things like food you know where can you go get food if, if you if you're facing food insecurity in your family where can you get you know housing assistance or rental assistance uh in your community or in your housing you know development or where you live or um how can i help you know your 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 kid uh you know use the internet and use broadband uh, to get their education, particularly during the pandemic. So there's a lot of different roles, I think, that promotoras um, are able to do, and, and we should really leverage that and celebrate that, uh, celebrate that model uh, in communities, particularly Latino communities. But I mean, I, I can't underscore the, the, the importance of community health clinics as trusted actors, but also because I think community health clinics are in close proximity so in places like LA, for example, um, you know, we use transportation a lot. And what we're hearing is that, you know, people go to where they feel like they're respected, but also where it's close in proximity. And so I think there is something to be said about local community health clinics and the benefits that they provide for our communities when it comes to health access and being able to also facilitate the communication uh, around you know information and education for our communities uh, in a, a host of different 
areas when it comes to to health and this health healthcare service delivery model. Dr. Modi, I want to get another question, so I'll ask this one to you. Children and others may find it difficult for physical activity in neighborhoods where there's, where there's a lot of violence. Uh, there's the, the idea of safety. Just basically going to a baseball field and throwing the ball around may not be uh, as accessible in some places. How do we tackle this problem? Yeah, again, I, I think this is part of the conversation we're having uh, around uh, those social uh, conditions. Uh, Dr. Lopez uh, talked about access and, and how do we ensure that, that they have, that we provide those communities the opportunity. So we need to get out of the hospital. We need to come out of the office. We need to go into the community and we need to partner with local communities because it's not enough that a healthcare company comes out and said, I'm going to keep your children safe. Um, by saying I'm going to keep your children hands, who's going to believe them? But if we go with a partner with the local communities, and we said we're going to work on safety, nutrition, on, on access to healthcare by providing uh, telehealth, for instance, and so on, that trust that comes with that partnership is what's going to make the difference, and that's also going to contribute to the shortage that we have of people who can provide a diverse work workforce. To Dr. Perez's point, when he said. Oh, the kid down the block, right? He's he's part of the community. People trust him because he's part of that community. So we we don't not going to have enough doctors within the community. So we need to start working with what Dr. Lopez mentioned, promotor de salud, and then and then that we can create that uh, community where we said we are not just going to provide help. We're going to provide safety. We're going to provide uh, access to care. We're going to provide education, food and security. We're going to uh, uh, make sure that your house is adequate, that uh, and if you need a, a console with us, uh, that we're going to provide virtual access. We have provided uh, also kits, for instance, for care uh, within the homes. We, last year, we sent 400,000 kits to people who could not leave the house uh, because of many reasons. COVID obviously being the main one. And we said, if you have a call, just test yourself and we can ask, give you access to that kit so you can uh, treat yourself uh, test, both test and treat. If you have a flu, we send treatment for flu. And, and so those are the kind of things that we do. Uh, and I know I have talked uh, mostly about Medicare Advantage. For those who you don't know, it's, it's Medicare, uh, equivalent to Medicare fee for service. We just um, have um, uh, access to other um, advantages um, anyway. But for children, we, we need to make sure that they are part of the, the family as a whole and that we, uh, again, partner with those uh, people in the community to, to provide the care that they need in their in their those community settings and in their own homes. And Dr. Perez Stable, what is the role of government, philanthropy, and business leaders in all these efforts? What role do they play? In specifically the safety in the in the built environment? Or safety in and built environment and the... addressing, addressing stair, uh, disparities. Well, I, my, the one institute I direct, the National Institute on Minority Health Health Disparities, is dedicated to research. So we fund projects in all of these topics that we've talked about, whether it be, you know, clinic, uh, food security, built environment, physical activity, diabetes, etc. Um, we clearly have uh, done a lot in the last uh, 21 months around COVID. And I think that has really put us out there in community engaged context. Uh, to address issues of testing, mitigating behavior, and vaccine uptake, particularly initially with the trials and now the, with people taking the vaccine. And, and uh, so that's what the NIH perspective is. Uh, however, government more broadly, you know, through HRSA, for example, the, the network of community clinics are funded. Um, it, is, it is a first line. Uh, it is generally uh, free or very low cost for out of pocket. It varies state to state, and it does vary by network. Um, I think having uh, recruiting and retaining high quality clinicians to those sites is a challenge uh, because uh, the compensations are not the same, uh, just like it's a challenge for some of the research uh, disciplines. So I, I think that uh, uh, that's uh, those are two examples. Uh, the rest of government does a lot of other programs. CDC does a lot of public health programs. Um, uh, and uh, and mon much of them goes through health departments, but not all of it. And often it is programs that engages community. I wanna reemphasize the importance of community health uh, clinics and the importance of uh, community health workers 
uh, or promotoras, as was out, were outlined earlier. I think this model has uh, has now arrived and people are understanding the utility of it. It's not just uh, a good thing to do for one community or another. It's a general method that will help us to get better health for the whole population. And, and our audience just... is... Oh, we have if to I wrap just, up. Sorry, Monica. We'll wrap, Monica, we'll have to wrap up. Sorry, Monica. But we want to tell the audience that please tweet your comments to the session at CHCI Summit. And we'd love to hear your questions if we continue this conversation. We're now going to go to closing panelist remarks. And I do want to start with you, Monica, as we, if we end our session. Monica, first off, tell us about what your organization is doing to, to address disparities and, and what you guys are doing. And please, if we can keep our comments about a minute or so so that all panels can get a chance to speak. I'll start with you, Monica. Yeah, we're working really hard to make sure that we're passing legislation and policies that are equitable, that we are centering the participant experience. I think as a part community partner, we've provided accelerator grants to different community partners to take advantage and to learn what we have um, the innovations that we can best capture as a result of the pandemic, and how do we make sure that those community partners on the ground are best able to serve the Latino community, um, you know, both with dignity and from an equity perspective. And so we're really working hard on the ground and funding those opportunities to best serve the communities. And that includes Prometoras um, across the country to make sure that they're helping to address food insecurity right on the ground and in Latino communities. Dr. Munio, 45 seconds, what are you guys doing? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, this was great for participating in this panel. Um, I, I think the message, the big message here is a health, as a health company, we understand the need to address social de uh, determinants of health. And that's where we're really making an effort in you know, reaching out to the community in closing needs in terms of uh, food insecurity, housing um, uh, development, uh, in terms of uh, making sure that, that uh, people have access to care. Uh, the second point is we believe in diversity. Equity for us is a metric of success. Success is not a nice to have. Uh, and that's what we've been working on this for, for the past 15 years. So it, equity is in, in, important. Diversifying the workforce is, is very important. Uh, Dr. Lopez talked about uh, uh, studying, doing research. So we, we have done, we identified doing retrospective analysis where the needs are. Mm. We actually just pu started publishing this year the American Health Ranking Disparities Report uh, built on a 31-year-old effort around American Health Rankings because we believe in the need to identify those, where those care, care gaps are located. And, and finally, we believe in establishing partnerships within the community and working uh, for every single stage in life, including our, our Medicaid Advantage program, where the houses are, the needs are more immediate uh, for the care of our Hispanic families in a very cultural sensitive way. I, I truly believe that it's no longer about writing the same prescription for 55 million people. It really is uh, doing personalized care and that's where we head into. Dr. Lopez, what are you guys doing? Well, I mean, I think one of the important reminders, I think, for the for the conversation is that you know Casey Family Programs is leading an unprecedented, groundbreaking initiative that is focused on uh, Latino families and children and their well-being. And I think the the landscape analysis that we're conducting is uh, going to be transformational and, and really uh, an, an important piece of not just information and, and for gathering that information, but to really utilize both the you know, lived experiences that we're learning from and, and all of that been shared, but also in terms of policy programs and practice, how do we then move on this agenda to ensure that Latino families and children and their well-being, that they're they're able to thrive, that they're able to be treated with dignity and respect, but that they're also able to access these different, uh, you know, whether it's economic opportunity, um, health, you know, services, or other uh, needs that serve in many ways as barriers right now, but 
we believe, I think that this, this is an opportunity to really make a, a difference uh, and to really make a difference in the lives of these families and children uh, so that we can advance an agenda that first and foremost is focused on equity and making sure that there are equitable outcomes for these Latino families and children. And Dr. Perez Stable, tell us the National Institute of Health is gonna save us. <laughs> I wish I could. I, I think that everyone at NIH is so committed to improving people's health. But I think the, the COVID has really brought uh, a, a new awakening, so to speak. Uh, I, I say that in, from, from the heart. Uh, first of all, it brought disparities to the front line of the of news in March of 2020, when the rates of infection and severe disease, hospitalization and death uh, were two to three times among Latinos and African Americans and other groups uh, compared to whites. It, they were just just really big disparities that we don't see in in, in most other conditions. Um, and that hasn't changed <laughs> after 21 months. Uh, we're still seeing, and at least the latest data I saw from like September, where still the ratios are about the same. This put a lot of energy then into two big issues. The, I mentioned before the community engagement approach. So how we got this, this vaccine, it works great. We'll just offer it and everybody will come get it. Well, it didn't happen. Uh, and we've got to really work to convince the population. I think we made a, a huge amount of progress in the last year with Latino and African American communities to, to take the vaccine. Now, we still have a ways to go, but we've made progress in that. And that's, I think, an important intervention. And the other is racism. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, I think, by uh, Jaime and others, um, you know, the, the recognition that we have had this systemic development of 400 years of building uh, structures and bureaucracies that have in, that has sort of established racism discrimination as part of our of our of the way we do things and no you know that people just take it for granted and I think from a research side we have made a call to say let's do research on how we can uh, reduce this uh, and understand it better and collaborate with you know housing authority with transportation with uh with food you know with multi-sectoral approaches to attack this i think these are i would say the two highlights uh of nih in the in recent times that will help us uh hopefully make lives better for our, our people our communities i'm told we have uh, two more minutes for us to give a momentary seconds of wisdom for each of you please limit it to 30 or 20 seconds i'll start with you monica give us some hope <laughs> I am I am very hopeful because I think that the pandemic has been so disruptive that it is allowing us to be bolder and for us to think outside of the box to consider community clinics as summer meal sites to think differently and how we meet and reach the needs of um, Latino children. And I lied. I think now I have to do the wrap up. So thank you, Bo, all of you. I want to thank our great panelists for this tough, thoughtful discussion. Dr. Eliseo Perez Stable, Dr. Linda Lopez, Monica Gonzalez, Dr. Jaime Murillo. Thank all of you. Please keep tweeting about the Health Summit at CHCI Summit, uh, at CHCI Summit, uh, our hashtag CHI Summit. We will have one more session scheduled for today, a preliminary discussion focused on the advancement in health technology. And tomorrow, join us for a day-long tech summit. If you know anybody who's interested in the summit, encourage them to log on and register at chci.org. Everybody, keep your steps in, eat healthy, uh, keep informed on the latest healthcare information. Please get your vaccination, wear your mask, and we'll see you next time.